start the recording for this session as well. Um, so today, um, this is one where I'm really excited about. Um, and it's also a bit funny one because it is our last Agile Auckland meetup for 2020. Some were delighted that 2020 is coming to an end. Some were really weird that it's already coming to an end. But nevertheless, um, before we close this year off, um, I am extremely delighted to uh, welcome our guest speaker, Francie Turner. Um, the funny thing is that a few weeks ago, I, I met Francie uh, for a coffee and um, it couldn't be more than two people had never ever met or seen each other and sitting in a cafe drinking coffee and find out that you're completely similar. Um, and that has kicked off a really cool friendship already. Um, and as soon as she shared her story to me, I was kind of like, ah, I need you as a speaker because you have an amazing story. So um, I will stop talking pretty soon and leave it up to her. Um, Frenzy um, is a, um, an, what is your new role now exactly at IAG? You're... Well, I'm three days into my new job. So working it out, um, I'm a lead delivery coach here. Yes, awesome. Um, she is, uh, she, previously she's been a, a Scrum Master Agile coach. Um, but her main knowledge about behavior, mindsets, high performing teaming came from her own experience as being a rower and not just a rower, but she was part of the 2016 Olympic team, New Zealand Olympic team. Um, and she's here to share her story um, uh, of all her adventures, but pretty much linked to what is high performance uh, within a rowing culture. So Francie, thank you so much. Um, you can hit it off um, as soon as you are ready to do so. Cool, thanks Marcella. And um, hi everybody. Appreciate it's a beautiful sunny evening out there and that you're giving up maybe Wednesday wines to or you're multitasking having Wednesday wines and joining me. Um, so great to have everybody down the line. And before we kick off, just want to share a quote um, from one of my favorite authors, James Clear. He's an author of Atomic Habits. And this is the lens I want you to apply through my um, story. So the quote is, when reading books or listening to podcasts or taking advice, remember that everyone is biased to their personal history. The world is complex and there is no single path to success. Look for patterns that are repeated across many successful people, not single stories. So I just want to highlight and reiterate that piece around patterns. Um, and that's what today is all about. So this is going to be relatively interactive. Marcel is going to be my right hand lady. So we're going to use the chat box function. Um, I'm going to get you guys to use that. We will also stop halfway through and take questions. Um, and we're going to have a little bit of fun with it because it's the last one um, for Agile Auckland for the year. And I think I've officially just heard the first Happy New Year. And I don't know how I feel about that, but <laughs> I've heard this. So I'm going to share my screen and we are going to kick into it. If hmm. you guys have okay. any questions for Frenzy uh, while she's presenting, please put them in a the chat box. But I will keep an eye on them and I will make sure halfway through her presentation, she can take on a few of your questions. Yeah. Cool. So you can see that, Marcel? I can. Yes. Perfect. Okay, guys, um, we're going to set the scene. And often when we set the scene, it can be helpful for you to um, close your eyes. Or I want you just to imagine what I'm going to walk through with you. So I'm going to take you back to August 2016, Rio Olympics. We're sitting in the start blocks of the women's eight. It's Deathly silent, apart from a few cars and traffic you can hear behind you. And the starter says, two minute call. Then he starts calling out, Netherlands, Romania, USA, 
Great Britain, Canada, New Zealand. Beep. So this is the moment where New Zealand's first ever women's eight has come to the Olympics. And this is what I'm gonna to talk to you about as New Zealand's first and only female coxswain um, to come to the Olympic games. And I'm gonna share my story of how I ended up in those starting blocks in a once in a lifetime opportunity and moment. But before we get into that, really curious to understand from you guys down the line, what do you know about a coxswain? So, what I should tell you is I'm five foot two, um, which is 159 centimeters, so I'm not very tall at all. Relatively loud and chatty, but coxswains do slightly more than just be loud and chatty and really short. So really curious to hear from you guys, either to come off mute, I'm gonna stop sharing or pop in the um, chat box. What do you know about coxswains? I've got some some reactions in in the chats. Set beat pace for rowing team. Uh, I've got a nothing as well. Motivate the team. Small with a big mouth. They are the key decision makers in the boat. I like Angela. She <laughs> I like her response. <laughs> <laughs> Smallest person in the boat. <laughs> Cool. So um, great to hear there's a little bit of knowledge down the line. So everyone is totally correct. Um, maybe minus the uh, they do nothing and I can see they get dunked in if they win. So totally. Yep. So <laughs> how I explain the role of Coxon is it's very much a servant leader role. So if you think about it, it's almost like a scrum master where your role is in there where you're motivating the team. Your responsibility, responsible for understanding what is the strategy? How are we going to execute our race plan? As well as really familiarizing yourself with the psychology of your athletes, knowing what are their trigger points? If I say this word, what sort of reaction am I going to create? And what is the culture and psychological safety I'm going to create in this environment in the crew? Um, and, you know, you're also really there to protect the crew from distractions. You know, I talked to you through the guys through the start line. There's so many distractions going on in that moment. So how can you protect your crew from that? And that is very much the role of a coxswain. Um, so this is one of the ways I got into um, agile and agile coaching is through the similarities. So how I actually started rowing was back in 2005. Uh, I went to, uh, some of you are familiar with rowing, Rainy Roo Girls School in Christchurch, very um, popular rowing school at the time. And I wasn't very good for the first three years. Um, and I actually didn't win a medal. I kind of just sucked, but I built a whole lot of resilience. And that that's what um, is the nature of a coxswain is to be very resilient. So it was through um, high school rowing that I became successful in my last year of high school. Um, and I started in the New Zealand age group um, rowing and I got second, um, went through under 23s, which is also age group and won two silver medals. Then got dropped from the sport, which was a blessing because I actually went away and completed an HR degree. And then in 2015, New Zealand um, rowing got some funding um, for, high, uh, for women's eights. And just to kind of put it in perspective, it's about a million dollars to send an eight overseas because you spend three months of the year training um, and competing at World Cups. So in 2015, I was invited to come along and trial to see if I would be successful. And so this is where my story is going to start. So let me share my screen again with you. Okay. Hopefully you can see that full yes. screen. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So this day is one of the happiest days of my life. This is in 2015, where we qualified the women's eight. We got second. Now, for those of you who watched the 
uh, rugby game in the weekend. This is exactly like Argentina beating New Zealand. It is a historic moment in the world of sport. And this row, uh, row and race where we won silver is incredibly vivid in my mind. Many of you will have heard the term flow. That flow state you reach when you just relax and you're in the moment and you're fully trusting your instinct to execute what you have trained for. And this race just summarizes flow. I can remember we came, um, so a race is 2000 meters long. And in the first 500 meters, we were sort of sitting in fifth position. We were well behind the other crews, but we just had this trust that we could row a really solid middle 1K and that we would row through the field. And that's exactly what happened because in the last 500 meters, we found ourselves itching from third into second place. And it was just the ultimate moment of flow where everything came together and one of the proudest moments of my life. Now, this just wasn't an incident. There was a lot of hard work and preparation that went into it. So what did we do? Well, in 2015, um, we, you know, an Olympic cycle is four years. So you generally train for three years up to it, you build up, and then the fourth year you have the Olympics. So we were joining in 2015. We had one year building and we did an into a position as we had a coach who was incredibly strong on the teaming aspect of performance. So he would forego on water training sessions to prioritize those team dynamics and discussions. Now, if any of you are familiar with high performance sport or have seen any recent articles about the culture challenge for a coach, well, actually, we're going to put aside on water training to say, what is it we're going to focus on? How is it we want to turn up? How is it we're going to form trust within one another? And our coach did that because he knew we were one of the most inexperienced crews. We had only had one athlete in our boat who'd been to the Olympics before. A really strong athletes at the Olympics and meddling. We were also a light crew. So we had a crew average of around 72 to 74 kilos. Compare that with a lot of crews such as the Americans of Great Britain, Britain who sit around 80 kilos. So we were quite tiny um, and we were very young. We had an average age of 21, 22 at the time. Um, so we were really up against it. So what he did was we spent some time really identifying our strengths. What was going to be our competitive advantage if brute strength and physicality was not going to be it? So what we really focused on was technical excellence. How could we outperform any crew and be technically superior? So that was great. But to build on that and, and bring those strengths to life, we really worked out, well, what were the values we were going to turn up with? So they were things such as daily excellence. So whenever you turned up for a gym session, you turned up for a row, it was your responsibility to, to be the best version of you. It was your responsibility to make sure that on a Sunday where it was your day off to rest adequately. You know, there was no often Saturday night drinking because you had to recover, put yourself in the best position. We also had a huge focus on the process, never the outcome. Yes, we had an outcome of qualifying for the Olympics, but the process of how we rode how we executed a race was far more important. And we built this incredible philosophy around ultimate trust. And I'm gonna explain this further of what this actually means in a woman's crew. Um, but we did things such as team reflections. Actually now I would call them a team retrospective where we talked about, hey guys, what went well? What did we do really well? What could we do better? And what's the one thing we're gonna focus on next week? 
Um, so we were being agile without realizing it. Um, so this created a great culture of no blame, um, team responsibility and ownership. So 2015, um, winning silver, beating um, crews like Great Britain and Canada, got us in a position for the Olympic Games. So this fast forward is 2016 at the Olympics. And I see a question where someone said, the Cox is facing forward and everyone is facing backwards. That is correct. So I sat in the stern of the boat. I couldn't actually see all the athletes, but I, you learn to feel and synchronize with what they were doing and the athletes were all facing forward. Fun fact is you don't actually move, we call the oar, through the water, you move the boat past the oar. So where the oar goes in, it creates what we call a puddle, which is a tight circle, and you push the boat past that. So 2015, as I said, was one of the greatest moments of my life, particularly that race where we won silver. It was the flow state. And that is very contrasting to 2016, the Olympic year. You know, it was phenomenal. We achieved a New Zealand first, and I still am New Zealand's only female coxswain to go to the Olympics, which is, you know, an outstanding achievement that I will hold with me for life and something I'm incredibly proud of. But 2016 was also a very disappointing year for us in our performance. And one of the reasons was, so four weeks before the Olympics in Poland, we had a World Cup where we won. We beat Great Britain. And what made that so disappointing was Great Britain got second at the Olympics and we ended up in a position of fourth. And now that position of fourth is, is not a bad position, but the challenge around that is we never executed the best possible race we could. We allowed the pressure of the Olympics to get to us and we also forgot one of our simple values, which was focusing on the process, not the outcome. And I'm gonna to talk to you now about where that contrast came in and, and the build up in 2016 towards the Olympic Games. So like many um, athletes and sports teams, we had done something that was incredible. Now that comes with expectations to perform. And you might have heard me say before in 2015, you know, we had a great coach who really focused on the teaming aspects of performance. He had the courage to say, no, we're going to put aside on water performance to focus on team dynamics, focus on those values, focus on accountabilities. But when the expectations of 2016 and the Olympic Games came on, I noticed subtle differences where the focus was around on water performance. You know, we forgoed the team building exercises. We started to forgo the weekly reflections um, sessions because for lack of a better word, they became a, a pissing in each other pockets situation where sometimes we would say what was going well, which wasn't actually going well, and we couldn't really be honest and upfront. The environment of trust was starting to erode. And what we started to see, like many leaders in, in many organizations, um, is when there's the pressure to perform, our behaviors shift to micromanaging. There's an expectation of, we need to know the answer. We need to be able to tell, to dictate, to tell our teams what to do because, you know, we were successful, we need to perform, so I will tell. And we often want to be the hero. Now, I share no blame with my coach, but it's the environment and the culture that comes on and with those expectations. And for me, that started to show up in self-doubt and self-blame. So I started to really question my abilities. I started to blame myself and I started to get myself triggered into fight and flight. 
you know, I, I was all, often so fearful and scared of what was going to be said in a debrief after a race or a debrief after a row because I was feeling insecure about my own performance. And so it was very subtly different 2016. There wasn't huge changes, but the expectations to perform started to erode at some of the basic things around teaming. And something you guys are gonna be very familiar with is the five dysfunctions of a team. And this explains it as best as I possibly know how. So we know at the bottom of that pyramid sits trust or lack of trust. And that underpins the difference between 2015 and 2016. And let me explain this by often we look at rowing and a crew as the ultimate different definition of a team sport. But I view that through a slightly different lens where a rowing boat is, or an eight, is actually nine individuals that are perfectly synchronized to do the exactly the same thing at the same time. Now that only happens when you fully trust the girl in front of you and you fully trust the girl behind you. You just let go of what are they doing? Are they rowing the right stroke at the right time? Are they technically in tune? Are they applying enough pressure? Because when we worry about what the people are doing around us, we suddenly forget to row the best we can possibly row. So in 2015, and that build up year where we achieved New Zealand first and got silver, we had ultimate trust. The crew just focused on themselves, focused on how they could row each stroke the best they possibly could. And they just trusted that everything would take care of itself, that everyone would be the best. And in 2016, with that blame starting to creep in and that focus away from teaming, we started to worry about what were each other doing. The crew started to worry about, was Francie doing her job or was she not doing her job? And when they were doing that, they were never rowing the best they could possibly row. And that had a massive impact. And if we go all the way up the scale, you know, we lacked conflict. I talked before about saying, well, we, we let go of those retrospectives because we weren't having that healthy conflict, which wasn't creating the commitment um, to the team, which meant we weren't becoming accountable for our results. We were blaming others in the crew rather than ourselves. voila, we didn't get the results we wanted. Now, as I talked about before, the results was, yes, we got fourth, but was also we never executed that flow state and rhythm that we achieved in 2016. So I'm hoping now you guys are starting to see some similarities to what is showing up in your workplace or workplaces you've experienced or sports teams you've been a part of or someone in your family. So what we're going to do, Marcella, is we're just going to take a break. We're about halfway through and check in and see what questions people have. And I'd be really curious to hear people's observations or, or comments on my experience. So I'll stop sharing now and we'll just, yeah, open it up to the floor. There are no questions in the chat. So if you have a question for Frenzy up until now, uh, just come off mute and you're more than welcome to share your question with her. Everyone is amazed. Thanks. <laughs> I'll, I'll have one for you, Marcella, to kick us off. We'll co-facilitate. Is yes. <laughs> you know, hearing what I've just shared, what comes up for you in in the world of work you're in? What similarities do you see? Whether you sit in a boat or you work in the office, um, the trust element is so key in whether you perform yes or no as a team like you can still perform in an individual level 
Um, but yeah, I think that it's, it's so similar. It's so similar. Um, I, I've got a few questions now coming in um, and some few, uh, a few comments as well. So Jim, uh, we don't have a healthy conflict now, so we are not a great performing team. Uh, Rob is sharing also some, um, some comments. Great insight that the focus on other performance disrupts your own performance. Yeah, I think that is really good as well. Trust is important. How to build trust is key. Uh, Frenzy, can you maybe share like what was for you personally the moment where you started realizing that something was off? Uh, I'm going to share this a little bit further later. Yeah. I think the okay. true observation, the true reflections came post um, the Olympics because so often when we're caught up in, in that expectation to perform, we don't allow ourselves the space to actually reflect rather than blame ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and when we don't have that culture of trust, it's very easy to blame and say, what did I do wrong? Yeah. Rather than saying, actually, we're a whole team in this. Yeah. Um, where I probably started, and I'll share it further to notice when things were going wrong, is when the coach started to focus on I, as the servant leader, had to fix everything, mm -hmm. rather than putting it back over to the team and saying, hey, guys, this is showing up. These are the behaviors. What can we do about it? Um, and I read a, a fabulous quote today around us as coaches is we don't need to be heroes. We need to be hosts. Yeah. And that's how I would look at 2015 verse 16. In 2015, we were hosts. We were hosting the platform for the team to self-discover, to figure out how we could do things for ourselves. Whereas in 2016, we tried to be the heroes. Mm -hmm. Being a hero is not a great idea in my um, experience. Yes, but being a hero feels good. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh. I've got another question um, uh, popping up. Um, Angela, can you come off mute because you asked something, but I just wanted to check if that's related with what I asked Fancy already or did you want to add something? Um, I think you, you said it as I posted it. <laughs> Funny that. Um, I'm wondering, the other question I was going to ask, so that, that was the question around um, that moment, because I think what's really interesting is when you have high-performing teams and something happens and there's that shift. Um, I guess for a team that, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful, a wonderful thing. If you were coaching that same team that you're in, what would you have, what would you have done to help get it back on track to address some of those behaviours? Great question, um, Angela. I think it's about being honest and upfront early on. And when you are seeing those behaviours, taking people taking people into, say, an off-site, away from the rowing, away from where we row, and say, look, these are the observations and using data so often like we do in a... In a retrospective, we need to use data. Otherwise, if we use personal observations, we trigger people because we're asking, we're, we're provoking that personal behavior to come up. And so what I would be doing is bringing that up and creating safety. You know, we, we didn't actually ever use things such as safe zones. It's only like once I've learned about them now in my professional life and saying, well, we need to be truly safe. We talked about making sure when we didn't go home, we didn't gossip and bitch because we're a group of girls, which is incredibly difficult in a high performance culture. But really embedding those safe zones and saying, hey, look, we've got to all own this performance. What is one small thing we're going to focus on today? Um, and how are we going to bring that in? Um, look, that's easier said than done. And there's small things I would have done differently. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff going on, which I'm gonna share with you in a moment. And, and that's why the talk is called Winning at All Costs. 
but it's about being open and that's why I have come into the world of coaching. I wholeheartedly believe it is my sole responsibility with any team I work on to bring that up. You know, it, it's very hard for teams who are hurting and blaming each other to do that. So it's my role as a coach to say, I'm going to surface this and I'm going to do it safely. If there's tears, that is okay. I don't mind that as a coach because I trust myself from my experience that if you don't surface it, it only gets harder. And so that's one of my big passion areas as a coach is to bring that into my work, my engagements, all my experiences, my friends. I'm, that's just something I learn from my experiences. But I'm not going to detract too much. Um, <laughs> Is there any other question there, Marcella, or we'll kick into yes. the next piece? I've got one more question from Dee. Um, I am wondering how can we cultivate trust? And if we don't have trust, how can we work on it? And when do we call it quits? In other words, leaving the team. Yeah, so... <laughs> Going back to the five functions of a team, if many of you dysfunctions, if any of you heard the book, I think when I was audio listening to it, they said, talk about where you come from school. <laughs> and now I'm a great believer in things like that. Um, and finding commonality outside of work. I use questions like, what scares you? Um, people don't like that, but you know, we've got to build trust in, in things we have in common. And often in rowing, that was things outside of it. Now, if you, and I'm going to talk in the, in the moment about trust, but a lot of trust also came around the values and holding true accountability to those values. Because one of the worst things we can do in a team is create a team charter and behaviors and not hold people accountable to them. That is one of the fastest ways I have seen it of eroding trust and something that we need to help the team call each other on and that we need to be willing to call each other on. Now, if you go through that, you have strong values in place, strong behaviors, you've got strong accountability and that there is still no trust. What I often say is, A, do we have the right people in the team or am I the right person for the team? Often it may not be the people around you, but it might be your work in that team and, and having the vulnerability to say, hey, look, can I invite someone else in here to help surface this? Because so often we're too close to the problem or we just need a different perspective. And it's only once that you've tried that that I think we need to start to question and say, well, look, something's not really happening here. What do we do as a team to move forward? But I often like to say, what is it that I'm doing that could be eroding it? And is there someone else who is a different person who can bring it up from a different perspective? It's not that I'm bad or I'm wrong, it's just different. So hopefully that answers that question. Great, Francie, awesome. Um, I will leave it to you uh, to start your presentation again, yeah? Cool, perfect. And as I go through, said at the start, this is just my experience and I'm hoping you guys are starting to see some patterns. Um, yeah, so just good to reiterate that. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, the true cost of winning. And I'm moving in my seat because this makes me feel uncomfortable <laughs> um, like so many behaviors show up. So, one of the most difficult parts of 2016 in the Olympics for me was we were very disappointed in the whole Olympic performance um, because we never executed how we should. And everyone was incredibly hurt when we finished that, that final. There were a lot of tears. And one of the things we didn't do is we never debriefed that race fully and when we hurt and we never sit down and analyze it people blame and I got a lot of that blame 
and as I said before, you know, you guys can see is a coxswain's not actually in there doing the work. You were there guiding, motivating and strategy. And so it's very easy to blame a coxswain because you're sitting on your bottom. And so I carried post the Olympics a huge amount of blame around the performance. And what I'll also add is I was carrying a huge burden leading into the performance and carrying a lot of blame for how the team was going. So about three weeks out from the Olympics, one day I just kind of had a breakdown. I just couldn't go to training. I was in tears. And what had led up to that stage is I hadn't slept for three days. And what happened at the time is I was put on sleeping pills for three days because that was the maximum amount of time they would put me on. Um, or I'd get addicted. That didn't really work to put me back into a normal sleeping pattern. So I would get things like acupuncture in my head. Um, and then I would take some sort of tablet that had the side effects of sleepiness to help me sleep. What I didn't realize at the time is that that is actually anxiety showing up, but it was treated as a medical issue. Um, so I was carrying a huge amount of pressure and blame and build up. And I should also add there was tendencies from my coach to bully me. And I'm not going to go into detail because that is unfair of me now because I understand the pressure he was under. But I was being bullied. I was being blamed. And we didn't have that trust. So the girls were starting to blame me. And I was very, very depressed when I left Rome. There were days where I struggled to get out of bed um, and it still kind of hurts now. Um, in the weekend, for the very first time, I sat down and watched my Olympic race and that triggered me right back to four years ago. Um, there's some, still some work I need to do around it, um, but it is still a very triggering moment. And so even though, you know, in this photo is one of the highlights for me around the Olympics of where we all got given a punamu um, donated by Naitahu. The Olympics, it, you know, this is a highlight of my mo uh, sorry, a highlight moment, I should say, of, of this ceremony. It was the cloak wearing ceremony. It was fantastic. I actually held the Olympics and still do in a lot of pain. But it was sort of three months after the Olympics, I was depressed. I was still carrying around this anxiety that I decided enough was enough and that I was going to take some control. I was going to be in control of my own destiny. Now, that meant actually going behind the back of my coach to see a sports psychologist, because in 2016, he had told me, you don't need to see the sports psychologist, any psychology you get, you're gonna get from me. So I was like, well, I have a choice here. I have a choice to look after myself or I have a choice to listen to the coach. And I, and I took that choice of I'm going to look after myself. And so it was through um, my psychologist that we really started to unpick it. And, you know, the best thing he ever told me was the first time I went to see him, he said, Francie, you are not effed. I was like, I can do this. OK, <laughs> that is what I needed to hear, the simplicity of those words. And so we started to really work towards creating some values and allowing me to have some dignity again. And then um, at the start of 2017, I actually had a new coach. And the coach surfaced for me. He said, hey, Francie, you know these girls are all saying or blaming you behind your back. What you see and what happens behind closed doors is very differently maybe it's time for you to think about what you want. And that's when I really thought about what I wanted. And I decided I no longer wanted to be part of a blame culture and that we probably were past the point of debriefing our race and that I wanted more to my life than the next four years of rowing up and down a stretch of water. Now, I do not blame any other woman I rowed with. I do not blame the coach. I blame the system, the pressure that came into it, how that um, eroded trust, 
and then how the expectations got in there. I don't hold anyone personally accountable, but it's tough. And so in 2017, I made the decision to walk away from rowing. I'm really proud of myself that I made a true values-based decision. And now that I now I can reflect and gain these lessons from rowing, but also put myself in a position where I never want anyone else to experience what I experienced. And I also do that um, as a personal coach. So I'm an internationally ACC coach. I do it in my work and I do it. And it's also really shaped how I view the world in my mindset. And the biggest mindset I've adopted now come from um, working with my psychologist and the world of coaching is we are human beings, not human doings. You know, when we turn up rowing, when we turn up to work, we turn up as wholeheartedly emotional. We turn up with feelings that are going to impact us. Whatever happened at home is going to come to work. And through that mindset of we're human beings, not human doings, I reflected on these three things. The first thing is leadership is lonely. When we're in a leadership position, we're often expected to know the answers, to be the hero, not to be the host. And so it can be really lonely to say, I don't actually have the answer. I'm going to actually make a tough call when I don't want to make a tough call, but you have to, we, you know, we've got to hold two realms in our minds of leaders of, yes, we want to please people, but actually we need to keep them accountable. And we've got to do that in a way that the rest of the team is going to respect me. And so I can build trust. So it's actually incredibly lonely. And so we must partner with our leaders. We must create the space for them to be themselves. We're not there to be their hero. We're there to be their host. We're there for them to be vulnerable and to be human and to say when things feel uncomfortable and when they need support so that they can turn up for their teams and help them team and prioritize the work and give them clarity as opposed to saying or feeling as a leader of I've under so much pressure I'm going to tell and dictate because that's all I know how to do in this situation. And like I do now, I hold no blame to my coach. I hold no blame to your crew. As coaches, we can't hold any blames to our teams and we can't hold any blames to our leaders. You know, we've got to understand when we're in the environment of pressure, it so often brings up these micromanaging tendencies that we don't mean to bring up. You know, I don't believe anyone turns up to work and says, well, I'm going to tell everyone what to do today because it's just easier. We often end up in there because we forget we are human and our teams are human. So these are my you know, parting messages to all the Agile Auckland community and anyone else you bump into tomorrow is if there's one thing you take away today, all I want you to remember is we're human beings, not human doings, and we bring our full self to work. So on that, I'm going to um, close my presentation and we will take questions, Marcella. Awesome, Francie, Francie, very good. Um, does anyone have any questions for Frenzy? If so, please come off mute or put it in the chat. Got some thank yous coming your way already. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing story, Frenzy. I think lots of people uh, loved your vulnerability part around your success story. Um, it looks so shiny, like I said um, to you earlier, being part of the Olympics looks so shiny and, and great for somebody outside, outside of a rowing team, outside of ever, ever going to be at the Olympics. Um, so yeah, hearing your story was so amazing um, to see that there's such a human perspective on it and it's not all glory. 
uh, to see. Um, if you have any questions, any comments, you can come off mute if you want to. I think to your point there, Marcella, that it's not shy, <clears throat> excuse me, shiny, is we often get caught up in that in the world of work too. You know, thinking a leadership role is shiny. And we don't often support our leaders to take that step. Mm -hmm. um, because it's actually really difficult. And the same with entering a high performance team or a high performance culture. It's incredibly difficult and you need to make a huge number of sacrifices, which are so great, but we also need to understand it's tough on us as human beings. Yep. Um, and that we need to, people need guidance to help navigate that. Um, and from the couple of people I've talked to, the great thing is, is rowing, is trying to address this. Um, and I just read the fantastic book, Legacy, about the All Blacks culture. You'll see so much of what I've talked about show up in that. So if anyone's wanting a good book around that, totally recommend it. Awesome. Very good. Uh, you, you just need to chat and read the chat later on, uh, Francie. There are lots of people thanking you for all sorts of things <laughs> that you mentioned. So very good. Um, are there any questions uh, from the people who are still here? I think that's a no. So I will wait and see if that changes. But um, Francie, um, thank you so much for sharing your story. <laughs> Um, it was really, really great to hear. And uh, what I loved is especially um, it is in such a different environment than most of us who are joining right now are working in um, and still seeing so many like seeing so many similarities between a Olympic rowing team versus an IT team or a sales team or any sort of team that we work with or work in um, was, was awesome to hear. It was very really good. So um, thank you so much. Um, thank you uh, everyone for joining. Um, this was our last Agile Auckland 2020 meetup. Um, it has been an incredible year, um, lots of interesting uh, conversations and guest speakers. Um, and yes, Angela, <laughs> I see your comment in there. It shows how Agile can be applied to non-digital teams, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Um, I want to thank you all for joining tonight, but also um, for joining all the other uh, meetups that we have been hosting uh, this year. We have some pretty cool guest speakers already lined up for the new year. So make sure you either follow us on the Slack channel, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever. Uh, but we'll keep you updated. Um, please be a member of the meetup uh, group so that you get automated emails when we do post a new event. Um, it looks like we have already some uh, cool stuff in January introducing the new scrum guide. So Edwin Dendo is going to do a presentation around all the new stuff around the scrum framework. So that will be pretty interesting as well. Um, Francie, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your story. Um, unbelievable to hear. Um, we will catch up really soon. Um, and for everyone uh, still on here, have a great evening and happy new year. Have a great <laughs> Christmas and we'll see you next year. <laughs> yeah, bye guys. And thank, thanks to everybody down the line. Um, and as I say, if there's anybody, I'd love to hear other people's stories. So um, find me on LinkedIn, send me a message. Yeah, I'd just love to hear from other people. Um, uh, any similarities? Thank you. Thank you. Happy new year. Thank you. <laughs> happy thank new year, guys. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Colin. See you soon. And well done, Francie, again. That was excellent. Bye, Fred. Bye, Colin. <laughs> awesome. Very good. Colin's Stop. sitting just out there. Oh, he is. <laughs>